we live on planet Earth. I'm sure you know that. I'm sure you know that. But do you ever really think about it? <laughs> like, 100,000 years in the universe is nothing. And humans have probably only been on Earth for what, a few million years. Uh, it's pretty astounding when you think about it that we're these monkeys. We have like these animal things going on. Like we've evolved these funny eyebrows. Look, my eyebrows lately, like after last year, got these like wings on them. I was thinking about shaving off this part, being like an evil, <laughs> evil wizard kind of thing. That's evolution right there. That's evolution. It lets you know that I'm serious. I mean business. <laughs> oh, there was a time when my beard, before it was all silvery like this, uh, before any of this had grown, like year, several years back, where it had grown and it actually had this reddish stripes, because I have some red hair red and brown and it was striped in a particular way it was only like a, it was pretty long at the time but not long like this and uh i kind of i kind of wish i had uh you know grown it out back then because it would have been striped in a fancy way what do we do with life it's impossible to know what the best thing to do is there's an author one of the great modern uh, authors, I don't know if you'd be considered one of the great modern authors. He was very influential in the 20th century. Viktor Frankl. If you haven't read the book, Man's Search for Meaning, you really owe it to yourself to do it, to read it. Or if you're one of the modern people, you could listen to the audiobook. In fact, you could probably get on YouTube and find someone reading it. Well, the story of Viktor Frankl is he was a psychiatrist who was in a Nazi concentration camp. And he came to some really phenomenal conclusions about humans. Mostly about humans in circumstances like his, extreme. But they're applicable to all people. Man's search for meaning. One of the main themes is that meaning in and of itself is somehow ephemeral. It's like the fragrance of a flower. You can't quite put your finger on it. But if you have a purpose, if you have a purpose, then meaning comes of its own. So a uh, big idea is you find your purpose and then you'll have meaning in life if you have a purpose. And extending in the vein of his thinking, he suggested people consider what's easy to do versus what's difficult to do. And what's easy to learn versus what's difficult to learn for a person. And a person should do what's for them an easy to learn and easy to do thing. That's where the person should focus their energies in life. It's an interesting book. I really remember the part where he would talk about they could tell who in the concentration camp was going to die because they would have been they would be smoking their cigarettes in the camp if you had cigarettes you could use them for favors for tactical advantage and no self-respecting survivor would ever smoke their cigarettes because they were too valuable and so if people saw the per people smoking their cigarettes, they knew that they'd given up. And in a lot of ways, that's what it came down to. People would survive if they had a reason to survive. When people lose hope, when people don't have a purpose or a reason, then they wither up and die. Simple as that. Granted, uh, they had the odds stacked against them. You know, it was an extreme situation. We're so lucky in the modern day. Most people in the United States have never been, most young people have never been to war. I mean, I'm, I'm over 40. I never went to war. You know, after uh, Vietnam, you know, someone could be 50 or 60 years old and have never gone to war. That's, that's like 
two generations basically you know 60 year old person that's a couple generations and it I don't want to say it clouds are are thinking but it war has been with humans since forever and we live in this insulated reality where we don't have to go to war we don't have to think about survival on that level at least we haven't thus far and God bless it hopefully we live out our lives without needing to but nobody's nobody's saying okay well you got that opportunity so you have to do these things however if you think about it uh, it, it seems like a great responsibility to have been given this luxury of peace and prerogative I feel like there's a real duty that comes with that a duty to accomplish something but what is that thing you know uh, other than refinement other than refinement there's nothing that says you have to do anything you know one person wants a family another person wants to be rich another person wants their own little farm another person wants a townhouse in New York City it's just everybody has different desires everybody is unique I don't know if you've ever heard of Ursula Le Guin but she was one great fan she's a great fantasy writer you know from the 20th century I'm not sure if she's still writing or if she's even still alive I hope she is but she wrote the Earthsea trilogy and another thing she wrote was well, Left Hand of Darkness but she also wrote The Lathe of Heaven Now, one of my great teachers early on Kathy Cook she I, I said oh people are all the same and she was no, no, they are not all the same. And uh, I mean, I had a relevant, I mean, a reasonable point. You know, we all have the same sort of drives and uh, psychic architecture. We all have the similar vehicles. I mean, granted, there's variations, but we all have a lot of common things. But when I said everybody was the same, she she took offense. She definitely took issue. And she recommended I read this book, The Lathe of Heaven. And it, this book is, uh, you know, again, you could find it on YouTube probably. But the, the main theme is that there's a guy who dreams. And everything he dreams comes true. And it's disturbing for him. Changes all of reality around him. So he goes to this therapist who slowly begins to believe him. And that therapist causes this man to dream in such a way as that he is benefited. The therapist is benefited. So he has the man dream that the therapist can accomplish these things. And lo and behold, then the therapist can dream reality. And so eventually the therapist, like at one point they want all humans to get together. So he has him dream something that will unite humanity. And what happens? A big alien invasion happens. Well, at the end of the book, everybody is gray. Gray face, gray hair, gray clothes. Everybody is equal. There's no diversity. Because everybody is equal. So, either you have equality or you have diversity. And guess which one's better? You know, to say everybody's equal is just, just laughing in the face of truth. Because people are not equal, right? We're, I'm short. He's tall. I'm white. He's black. You know, I'm boy. He's girl. Whatever it is. You know, people are not equal. We have different interests, different aptitudes. But I would say we have an equal right to dignity, self-respect, an equal right to laying claim to the love of God. There's something equal about our spirit soul or about our humanity. 
But people are not equal. Just not. You know, they have things called IQ tests, and some people score higher, and some people score lower. <laughs> is Are they equal? No. They're different. Everybody is different. Even identical twins are different. Identical twins are not equal. You know, they're just not. People aren't equal. So it's it's peculiar because there's this romance of I the ideal idealism. There's a romance to idealism. Like, hey, let's make the world a spectacular, loving paradise for everybody. We need to make people equal. No, 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 no. There's no making people equal. That's just a ludicrous idea. But there's a romance to this. And so bridging the romance of idealism with the pragmatic reality of our circumstances, that's tricky. You know, and, and a lot of people, especially especially young idealists, they take offense to people who seem somehow in their minds jaded or stagnant or fixed on some sort of archaic idea. But on the flip side, people look at them and say, well, they just haven't had the life experiences to temper them and somehow season them into acceptance of the diversity. We're going to live and die, and guess what? At the end of our lives, the world will still not be perfect. That's just a fact. But does this mean we should become discouraged and, uh, you know, throw drinking straws in turtles' mouths? Of course not. The only thing we can really do is develop ourselves. Enrich those around you through your example. Provide guiding light when it's requested or required. But we can't force people to do things. Nature will force up, put the force on us. I got bit by the Lone Star Tick, and I'm allergic to red meat. Like, I had experimented with vegetarianism before that, but I can pretty much promise you that I would have eaten a lot more meat in my life had I not become allergic to red meat. Now, I can step back from my life and say, I am thankful that I am allergic to red meat because, well, I feel like I live a healthier life because of it, because I don't eat it. <laughs> like, I don't eat hamburgers because it's wrong, but the bigger reason is because I'll break out in hives. <laughs> so, so I don't eat red meat, and I feel thankful for it. Actually, I don't eat much meat at all. Those poor animals are tortured. They're just tortured. You know, I went to India and the cows are, they've got personalities. Now, some of them are a little bit, they've got bad personalities, some of them. But they're just beautiful, sweet animals, a lot of them. And to think that they're just, I mean, a lot of these cow yards in the Midwest and stuff, it's just like fucking dirt. Or cow poop, you know. There's no grass. There's no trees. They get their troughs, and they got a big ass fucking stinky herd of themselves. It's not kind. It's not healthy. But what you gonna do? You can't, I can't go out there and force them to change. Although we could pass some laws to force veganism on everybody. I would actually vote for that. <laughs> like, I'd probably be ostracized by a lot of people, but. But I would vote to mandate veganism across the board. I would. I would vote for that. You say, you vote yes or no? I say, I vote for it. But uh, I think, I think you know, there's no answers in this world. There's just process. And having a good heart and having a sincere effort towards becoming a more refined, better person, hey, that's all you need, you know. It's like God's got it taken care of. We're just along for the ride in a lot of ways. So, anyway, bless you. Thanks for watching.